Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. So, what do Vikings and Sudanese warriors, uh, dervishes sometimes known in history, have in common? Well, more than you might think actually. So, quite simply, we're looking at swords here, but it's also related to shields as well. So, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Let's grab, here we go, here is a so-called dervish sword or let's say a Sudanese, probably uh, Beja, Hadendau, something like this, uh, tribesman's sword from the 19th century. These were brought back in their droves um, to Britain in the latter parts between the 1880s and the through to the 1890s, and in fact in the early 1900s as well, uh, because they were brought back as war trophies, uh, because uh, for numerous reasons that I won't go into, the British Army saw fit to go campaigning in Egypt and the Sudan in the 1880s and 1890s. And as a result, lots of these weapons were brought back by soldiers as trophies. And indeed, there was a certain amount of tourism in following years uh, to those areas, and these were brought back during that period as well. Now, one of the things that people uh, will immediately, when you pick up one of these swords, feel is how unwieldy and unbalanced it is. Um, now, what do we really mean by that? Well, I often talk about context in its many, many different forms on this channel. And what I've pointed out in the past is that a sword or any weapon, whether it's a rifle or a, a crossbow or whatever, is particularly designed to be used within a certain context. And when we're talking about swords, in this particular um, situation, this means that this sword is designed to be used with a shield. Now, I don't own a, a Sudanese Deva shield, unfortunately, but I do have a uh, Somalian or Ethiopian, could be either, um, shield of the similar period, so late 19th century, and it is made of very thick animal hide. I'm actually not sure what uh, type of hide this one is, but the dervish shields are made, or should we say the Sudanese shields, are made of, uh, they can be made of hippo hide, I believe sometimes rhino, elephant, I'm not sure, uh, sometimes I think um, cow hide, but generally speaking I think hippo hide uh, is probably the most common. But the main point is they're made of rawhide, thick leather, and they're very, very strong, but they're quite light. It's actually a very, very good practical combination for making a shield out of because it's very flexible. It's not going to split like wood does. Um, it's not very susceptible to uh, climatic um, sort of variation or kind of uh, being affected by the weather or the heat or anything like that. And it's very resistant and relatively light. And one of the things that um, people tend to get wrong sometimes when they're making reenactment shields is they tend to make them a little bit too heavy. Now, that's not to say that all shields are light. Let's pick up my uh, Viking era shield here. Um, so a lot of shields were actually historically very heavy if they needed to be. So, for example, a pavis uh, is a type of shield that is used more statically, and they are very often very heavy, and very thick, very robust. But shields that are designed to be used to be quite mobile, uh, even if we look at things like uh, Roman scutums, Viking era shields, later heater shields, um, Norman era shields, this kind of thing. And indeed, if we look at African shields, if we look at Zulu shields or Sudanese shields, very often you'll find that for their size, they're relatively light. Don't think they're super light, but uh, they, they are relatively light because you've got to be able to fight with them. And of course, this is the same basic argument we, we have to um, remind people of with swords, is that swords, you have to be able to fight with an object, okay? And if you're going to fight with something, yes, you want it to be able to do its job. Yes, in the case of a sword, you want it to be able to hit with a certain amount of power. Um, but equally, you want to be quick with it because if you hit the other person, and they're wounded and can't hit you back, well then you've won the fight. So if they've got a heavier weapon that in theory might have hit you harder, it's kind of irrelevant if they're now lying on the floor dead because you hit them faster. Um, so quick weapons are within certain parameters are definitely an advantage. So this is part of a weapon set. So I've spoken in the past about the gladius, for example, and people often ask me, Matt, what's best out of a gladius and a rapier? Or what's better out of a, a, a pirate cutlass and a, uh, I don't know, a Bronze Age leaf, leaf bladed sword, a Ewart Park type sword. And, you know, these, and these are, in a way, they're fun to answer, but in a way they're ridiculous questions because they, whilst they are both swords, they're used and in completely different periods by completely different people in completely different um, scenarios and situations. But there is a parallel to a certain degree between these dervish swords, between these Sudanese um, swords known as Kaskara, although you could look at the Takuba as well and it's got some parallels with it. Uh, there is some parallel between these swords and 
Viking era swords and quite simply it is that they are both designed to be used with shields. Now a gladius for example is also designed to be used with a shield but it's designed to be used with a scutum in mass formations. When we're looking at um, warriors from the Sudan, or when we're looking at warriors from Scandinavia, um, in the 19th century in one case, and in the, let's say the 9th century, so a thousand years uh, apart in the, in the other situation, they actually have some more parallels than you might think in terms of their fighting. They are both, for example, using shields, and they are both using boss grip shields uh, of varying size. They can be smaller, can be larger. Some people go, because they've watched certain videos on the internet, ah, oh, Matt, a Viking shield must be 92 centimeters across. Complete rubbish. I've dispelled this uh, in previous videos. Anglo-Saxon, Frankish, Viking era shields varied in size a lot. You had smaller ones, larger ones, you had flat-faced ones, you had convex um, ones, but they're all boss gripped. And these shields, the, the Sudanese shields, are also boss gripped. So they were using a shield predominantly for defense and they were using the weapon, the sword, predominantly for attack. Therefore there are certain characteristics between the Cascara and the Viking era sword which are quite similar and you can see they don't have hugely different blade shapes. Um, now to a certain degree the details of this Cascara are dictated by history, the fact that uh, how this sword came into the area. And in fact, these, these blades are very often German-made uh, blades. And um, in the period when this type of cascara was developed, in the medieval period, uh, often the blades were European imported, not always. Sometimes they were made within Arabic-speaking areas. And uh, they had cross guards like this. So the reason, actually, that this kind of sword looks exactly like this, with these multi-fullers, um, occasionally they have a rocasso, but with these multi-fullers and with this cross guard, it's partially because that's the type of sword that was kind of introduced into the Sudan um, in probably about the 15th, 16th century. And it just stayed there ever since because they didn't have a need to change it. It worked well for what they needed. So certain parallels, they're using a boss grip shield. They're using a predominantly cutting sword. Yes, you could stab someone with these, but you'll see that these both have what we call spatulate tips. That is, they're not really pointy swords like some of the swords behind me. They are uh, swords that are quite broad at the tip. The advantage of, as, as I've said in previous videos, the advantage of a broad tip is it means you can cut very effectively right out at the tip at your maximum, maximum reach. As soon as you start to make a sword uh, slender and pointy at the end, it becomes very much less effective at cutting near the tip and you have to cut further down, which reduces your reach. So if you're fighting in a predominantly cutting style of fighting with shields, um, aiming at whatever you can get at around the shield, or with both edges potentially, um, being able to cut from long distance is an advantage. And in fact, when we come to the Sudanese Cascara, the blades are usually 35, 36 inches long. So they are long swords. You'll notice um, compared to the Viking era sword, it is a longer blade. But part of that is almost certainly due to uh, technology. So by the 19th century, as I said, they were importing well-tempered monosteel blades from Germany. Uh, so they wanted the longest blade that they could easily manage, I would imagine, whereas in the Viking era they were having to make swords in more complex ways and uh, to a certain extent the length of the blades were probably dictated by the technology of the material they were using. So there are some parallels, as I say, using a boss grip shield, you, they want to have a blade that you can cut fairly far away with, uh, that you can cut fairly effectively with the tip with, but one of the strongest characteristics of these swords is that they balance quite far from the hand. Look at the point of balance on this cascara, okay, it is about 12 inches from the guard. That is crazy, crazy far out compared to most uh, later European swords. But if we look at the Viking era sword, the Viking era sword also balances about nine inches out from the from the cross guard. And bear in mind, this is a shorter blade. So if the blade was longer, it would balance further out. So in fact, these share quite a lot of characteristics in their basic statistics in terms of they are primarily cutting swords, they are broad, flat cutting swords, and they're swords that you wanna, as I say, you're using with a shield and you wanna be able to cut far away with and they therefore have a point of balance which is far away from the hand because if you are using a shield at the same time as using the sword, the sword becomes pretty much a dedicated striking implement. Yes, of course, sometimes you might guard with the sword rather than the shield, but by and large, 
you're wanting to lay out these very effective uh, big cuts from far away, they're going to have a lot of effect if they do land. Uh, and you don't need the swords to be as nimble at the tip or as closely balanced to the hand as later period swords because you're not defending very much with the sword, you're defending with the shield. Um, one thing I would say as well is as we go from the Viking era, we do eventually develop cross guards. So in Scandinavia, eventually the um, guards did get longer. And in fact, the pommels stayed that style for a while and then do develop into um, Brazil nut pommels, uh, by and large. And uh, certain types of kind of blob pommels or kind of rudimentary wheel pommels. And you'll notice that once we go a little later in period, we gain some similarities to the cascara in European swords, but we also gain some differences. One of the differences being, you'll notice this blade is tapered, and that's something we start to see as we go later in the Viking era, the blades start to get more tapered, which does make them a little bit more nimble. And um, may, there are many, many theories, and we don't really know the answers, but they may possibly, that may imply that the swords were being used in a slightly different way, maybe a bit more nimbly. Uh, maybe the swords were being used to defend more often than they had been before, we don't really know. Um, but you do have a cross guard, and one of the great questions is why do we, ad uh, why do we develop a cross guard? Um, and the jury's out on that, I'll save that for an another video, but it is worthy of note that, of course, the cross guard developed, we couldn't really say independently, because you have to remember at this period, the, uh, the North African kingdoms and the North African civilizations were in constant contact with Europe. And, you know, half of Spain was Muslim uh, at this time. Uh, the Franks had pushed out the, uh, the Moors out of the, out of the south. So there was constant contact between the Islamic world and the Christian world in Europe at this time. So we can't really say that they developed separately, but they probably developed somehow uh, in a related way. And we do start to find cross guards like this in the Islamic world at a similar time we start to find them uh, in Europe as well. Um, so there we go. Uh, who would have thought that a uh, Sudanese warrior of the 19th century would have anything much in common with a Viking? But I think that they really do, certainly when we come to their swords and what they were looking for from a fighting weapon and how they used those fighting weapons. These were, to some degree, individualistic warriors, not like the Roman legionaries who were taught to fight in close formations with their stabbing gladiuses and large shields. These were warriors who sought personal glory in this life and the next, they both had strong beliefs in winning glory in this life so they could go on and uh, live an even better life in the next um, realm. And um, they had these large chopping swords that they used with boss grip shields. Anyway, I hope that's been somewhat thought provoking. Give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. And I'll see you soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.